I guess uh, we all also would like to go home. Uh, so one part of, uh, of learning UHPLC, UPLC and LC, whatever we call it, is also how to, uh, you know, now we talked about what happens inside the heart of the instrument. Um, so now is how is it done? How do we get the equipment to do it? And some people will probably lecture the instrument before and then the columns after. And, uh, Maria and I have decided to learn you the chemistry and then the technology. Um, so one thing you should know is that as a function of time, when you see what comes out of a detector, we call this a chromatogram. And um, I, if you don't know this at the exam, then you're not having a good day. <laughs> so this, this is an important concept, that a chromatogram is what comes is the separation as function of time. Um, please note that and remember that also at 5 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> uh, so this is actually a sketch from the last time. And, and you know, and perhaps we, we will ask you this for the exam. You don't know. It could be. Say, would you please draw a HPLC system for us on the whiteboard? We're probably going to sit in a small room and um, then I would like a drawing like this. Um, so this is called binary because it has two solvents at the time. Because, and I can show this one around, this is the column, this is where the separation, this is where the small particles are sitting. And we have a lot of tubing, and if you look into the red tubing here, you see there's a very, very tiny hole. This is also why we need to filter the samples, because um, they also kind of clog up all these tubings. So the heart, the column, and it sits in a thermostate, so we know exactly which temperature it has. <laughs> we have to inject our sample, and we have our pumps and our solvents. And then we have to go to our detector. So this is more or less an HPLC system. And if you want to add a little more, you could say we actually have a degasser here or we have to degas our solvents, and then we will get very, very happy. This is the kind of detailing level you need. Um, so here again, same. It's just that if we want to mix many, many solvents in general, we then mix them, and then we add the pump. Whereas here, we then create the high pressure, and then we mix them. This is the best way of doing it. It will give you the most reproducible chromatography. Then we talked a lot about solvents. And the nice thing about a modern pump, a pump system, the system at all, of course everything is computer controlled, is that we can actually do gradients. So it means that we can start, if it's reverse phase, at 15% acetonitrile, and we can go very fast up. And some of the UPLCs, we can do this you know, within one minute. So if you have a very fast, if you have two compounds that are easily resolved, we can actually do separations in one minute. And if you're doing process control, that could be important. Anyway, we can do this so we can, in the column, when we have our C18, now one of them died, but, but hanging there, we can, we can by changing the mobile phase very rapidly, we can change the environment out there. And that is the whole trick, and this is what can give us very nice separations and very sharp peaks. And also because the pumps can do this very reproducible, they can also reproduce the chromatography. Um, so we have this slide on the allotropic strengths, and usually they come from normal phase. So it also means that the higher, the less retentive they are. Um, and usually we are down here with water and those. What is very, very important when we do HPLC, and this, goes, this will go for any kind of chromatography in this world, that we do mixtures of solvents. They, I mean, they have to be mixed. So we cannot take hexane and water because they create a two-phase system. So if you've got droplets of 
uh, one in another, you would get very unreproducible results. Your detector baseline will look like this. So it's very, very important that you can mix the solvents. So we can take acetone water, acetone nitrile water, and so on. But up here, if you want to use ethyl acetate, you cannot use water. You can probably just use methanol. But you need to test or need to look into a table to see can the solvent I want to use, can they be mixed? And if they do not create a one-phase system, you cannot use them. So, um, a slightly more detailed uh, HPSC system, and what you should recall it that, that all HPLC systems, they are computer controlled, and in general, they, most of them have a flow meter, so you type in into the computer software, I want, let's say, one milliliter a minute, 0.1 milliliter a minute, that you type into the software. The flow meter will then actually give a reading to the computer. And if the flow is too low, it will increase the pressure of the pumps. That, of course, also means that uh, if your column is clocked, you come with some very dirty samples. We inject them and they clock it here, so we have no flow, then the pumps will get higher and higher and higher pressure. And so another thing we always type into the software is the maximum pressure of that column. So um, usually we say that engineers never read the manual. When it comes to column, you do read the manual, else you will not be working in my lab. Um, so any column comes in a small box. And it says what is the maximum pressure, what is the pH requirement, you know, uh, because some columns will may not even uh, tolerate organic solvents. There can be many different things on a column. There can be some columns where you need to have a certain amount of organic solvent in. So, um, so there you type in the software, say, a normal reverse phase column, you would type in maximum 300 bars. If the pumps need to give more than 300 bars to, to give the, the, the flow rate you want, the computer will shut down the system. You can also type in, usually in the software, a minimum pressure. You know that it takes a certain amount of pressure to get, go through the column. No magic. So if it suddenly goes to one bar, you know something is wrong, computer shuts down the instrument as well. That are usually the things we put into the software. But remember, it's flow controlled. So, so also, if this one dies, you know, computer will get <laughs> confused and nothing will work. So, um, we usually have a pulse damper here, so you don't get too many many fluctuations in the pressure when you're mixing here. So, this is actually a true analytical separation. So this one is just a straight line, it's just, we typed in our gradient. This is a 10 to, uh, to 100 in 10 minutes. And see the pressure here. And you see it's going down. And we have a cesium nitride and water. Could anyone give me a hint of why the pressure is not constant? It's a little bit physics. Try to take some take some water like this. Taking some methanol or some hexane. You see it swirls easier. The viscosity is lower at the organic solvent. So a citron nitrile is easier to push through the column. This is why the instrument has to lower the pressure at all times. And you also see it's not a perfect curve because there's also some fluctuations from the pump. And this is probably as, this is reasonable. This is not perfect. Uh, fluctuations is probably two bars, and that's just acceptable, but it shouldn't be worse than this. Methanol, you will not see much change. Acetone, it will go in more drastically. And if you went hillic, so you went up in pressure, you go, you go the opposite way because then you get more and more water, so the pumps need to go up and up in pressure.
So usually most pumps have two pump heads. So the pump head A that goes faster here in the pistons and then the second one that goes half the slow, half the speed. And then they are then mixed. Um, and also the degas are very important. If you have old HPLC system, you may see that you sparkle the solvent with, um, with helium. Um, yeah, as I say, constant flow. And if you want to change solvent on the HPLC, it takes a while. So you have a possibility, and that is usually programmed, or in some instruments it's manual, you can say, now I want a whole lot of flow through the pumps, but don't go through the column. So it just goes through waste. That's also very important if you cannot get any flow uh, or anything through the column. It could be you didn't close the flow, the bypass valve or the waste valve. Very common thing. But the degas and everything has a certain volume of, I think, 20 to 30 milliliter. So if you change the solvent and you run at a flow of 0.1 milliliter a minute, it takes a while until solvent has actually passed through the pump. So you need to flush the pump to get your solvents in. And then you can start running your gradient. Um, it is actually not very easy to mix solvents. It sounds strange, but if you want to mix them without having a big, you know, if we wanted to mix a citron nitrile and water, we took this bucket and we had a flow of 0.1 milliliter a minute and we have the outflow here, it's going to take a while until we have a change here. With this bucket size, it's going to take forever. Um, so mixing all this stuff is, is quite difficult and if we do, do not do it well, we can have changes in retention time. So if the mixer is not working, we will not have reproducible chromatography and that is of course not very nice um, because then you cannot compare sample. And if you have created a mutant and you want to see which peak disappears, you would like to have constant retention times. So, so, some, so this is actually quite a place where the manufacturers have a lot of competition on how can they mix, how can they mix perfectly at a minimal volume. And I think, you know, it's a little bit like the parallel is that you have some ice cream, you have strawberry ice cream and you have vanilla ice cream. And they're really coming from the ice cream mach uh, machine and they're really, even though they're soft ice, they're pretty tough. You know, how will you mix them perfectly together without having, you know, again, a huge bucket and mixing it? How can you do this perfectly? This is actually very difficult. So usually you can do this and the mixers here usually have this volume. And of course it also means that whenever your pump is doing something, your column does not feel it right away. This is delay time. Any HPLC, UPL system has a delay time. And if you don't put this correct together, then it doesn't work. So you cannot take a very old HPLC system and set a very low new column with a very low flow rate on it will not work very well because it could take you 10 minutes before actually the gradient starts to work. Um, so that's mixing the solvents. So now this was here and now we can go, now we actually like to put the sample onto a column. How do we do that? So usually we do this with these loop valve. So this is how it's starting to do. So this now we are Conditioning our column, everything is ready. What we can actually do then is to uh, inject our sample. It fills up a loop here, and you can maximum fill the whole volume of the loop. And then what it actually does, it, it moves this one here. So suddenly now, your pump is not going there. This is a small groove that's grinded in. It's actually usually this big. So now the flow is going here, and you get your you get your sample put into the stream. It's not that easy to explain. It showed in another picture. So um, we can fill the valve, 
shut it and get our sample onto the column. And I have another video here showing it how it's done. So this is how a modern automatic auto sampler works. This is very nice. We don't have to put in our samples every hour or every 10 minutes. We have a computer taking care of it. So here we have our tray. This could be a micro tighter well plate or it could be small vials. So our needle goes through here. You see we have from our pump and it goes through here and it goes directly to the column. It goes in and now it has a little bit and you could fill the whole loop but usually we only fill part of it. So we have our sample here. Now to make sure, because if you, you could also have, if you have a needle, so a needle would be down in a vial, it goes up, you could have some samples sitting here, not much, but a little bit. So if you ju then just inject this directly, this valve port here will be contaminated. So next sample, you could have a sample where there's nothing of the analyte that goes in and then a little bit actually sitting there could be liberated and injected. That's called carryover. Any auto sampler in this world has carryover. It's just a matter of how little. And if you're working with analytes, let's say you're working in doping analysis, you really need to prove that the peak appearing in the, this athlete sample from this athlete is not coming, uh, it's not carryover from one of your positive control samples. So uh, you would need a lot of blanks and everything to prove that. So now it goes to the flush port, the needle is washed outside. And now it can actually go to the injection seat. And see now, this valve has changed. So um, now the flow goes this way. So now our sample is, is passing through and is coming in and can hit the column. So, let's have a little bit. So now to the column. And I'm not going to do a lot of the math that we do at the, uh, when I teach this at chemistry, but um, it's very important to, to know that we want as little, this is a little bit that's also coming from distillation technology, that you want the equilibrium to be as low as possible, so we want this as far down as we can. So, the smaller the particles you use in your column, actually the further down you go here, and the further high flow rate we can actually have it. So going down another column, you move this one, and it also gets flatter. And the flatter it gets, the better, because it means that we can run the column at a too high flow rate, and it still gives us good separation. And of course, that means if you can run at a high and higher flow rate, is faster analysis, you can get your results faster and you get a better uh, use of your HPLC system. So the price per sample goes down. Um, also remember that whenever you actually added the sample here, this is also why we have these very uh, tiny tubes, then your, your peak only gets broader and broader and broader. So diffusion is a little bit like the chromatography when you, like if you put a drop in water, you'll see it expand. So this is why we have these tiny tubes to, to make sure that it doesn't expand more than necessary. So also why the particles have to be so small. The larger the particle, particles, the less uniform the particles are, the more difference there is in the way, so you see here, this, this molecule you analyze here, fumonisin, is very happy. It goes directly through. Of course, it interacts with the stationary phase while it goes there. But it doesn't travel as much space as this one because here are some more larger particles. They're not packed well. So this means that this one comes out later. So this is why we continuously test new columns and we Every three or four years, we change our standard column to a new standard column because they get better and better. Manufacturers are simply, it's an arms race, you know, getting these more and more spherical, smaller and smaller, more and more perfect packing. Everything helps.
This is why you should never go back on 20, 30 year old columns because they are really, really bad compared to today. The way you, uh, the manufacturer packs a column. So now you've just seen a column. So the steel. Um, so we have a frit here. So the holes in the frit are of course smaller than the particles. Then they don't have this one. So then we, they come with the suspension of the particles, usually in methanol or in dichloromethane. And then you simply flush it through and then the solvent is going through and you fill up the column with your packing material. And then if this column should last at 300 bars, they will probably pack it at about up to 400 bars to make sure all the particles are nice and perfectly uh, uh, positioned. And then they place the uh, frit on top of it, so it stays there. And this is also why you should not go above the recommended pressure, because if you do that, uh, so you suddenly uh, get it compressed more than it was, then you get a perfect mixer up here, and then you get very, very broad peaks. And when that first happened, then the column is dead, and it's just to order a new one. Yeah, so here was also the curves with the, um, with the um, plates, was, you know, and we want this low plate height as possible to get as many theoretical separation steps. And as you can imagine, the 1.7 micron particles, they of course uh, get even flatter here. And on the very small particles, we can of course achieve these very, very fast separations. So, why don't we go to 0.1 micrometer particles? You know, why not uh, might go to one? Well, I hope you can recall, you must have been, had a little bit of chemical engineering. Uh, and you know, flows in tubes and all that. All that, oh, that's a cake next time. <laughs> so, so what is important, of course, is that we can reduce the time. But, see here, this is the important thing. So with the five micrometer particles, we get a very low pressure, or required pressure to keep, give a good constant flow rate. But see, it goes up here. And this is more a theoretical calculation, because what will, because what will really happen at 2,300 bars is we're gonna cross the material. You know, we still want this sponge. It's not easy to be a color manufacturer. They want us, they, we, we want them to produce a perfect spherical. It has to be very, uh, out in the outer layer, it has to be very uh, open, poured, and uh, you know, like a sponge. And it still has to be strong, really, really strong. So, so this is not possible, because then we will simply crush the material. Most material, the best materials we have today that are porous can go to about, they claim about 1,000 bar. But, but that's not all columns that are packed to this. Uh, and the, these are kind of the theoretical equilibrium steps. So it's more, yeah. It shows us how, how well can we separate things. Um, and so if you're a chem chemist, you would know this from distillation theory. Uh, this is how many plates you would have in the distillation column. So this one would probably go to the moon if it was that. Um, another thing that could import, be important if you want to have uh, fast separations is to go uh, at higher temperatures. So if your column, is re your analyte is, is retained too well, we can actually uh, increase the temperature. So, you know, it's a little bit like how fast are the molecules equilibrating with this and the, and the mobile phase, and the higher the temperature, the faster this go. So if we want our analyte out faster, we can increase the temperature, or if you have too poor retention, so you have a semipolar analyte, 
like the two the, no, it's like the two ones we looked at one of the assignments that just works on reverse phase, we could increase the retention by going down in temperature. We can go down to about 5, 10 degrees, then it gets really difficult because then you start to get a lot of condensation in the column oven and it gets a little bit complicated. There's not much mass in, in chromatography, there's a little bit. So when we want to change our column dimensions, uh, you have to recall that if, if the flow is going this way, you know, it's the cross section. So we want to change our separation from a one millimeter in a diameter column to a two millimeter. We have to add four times a higher flow because then we'll get the same linear velocity in the column. That's important. So it's linear velocity in the column. So it's a cross-sectional area we scale it with. So if you double the diameter, you have to take four times as high a higher flow rate. Um, the same thing, so when Maria wants to purify enough compound, one of her analytes, to do NMR, you know, she goes up in column diameter. And so if she goes up, if she goes from a two millimeter ID column to a 20 millimeter ID, it's 10 times, 10 times to the second. I hope you can remember that that's 100. Uh, then she has to increase the flow rate a hundred fold. And that is, in practice, she has to go to a different HPLC system because there's no HPLC system that can handle extremely low flow rates and extremely high flow rates. So that's what we call a preparative system. Then also, solid consumptions start to get a little bit expensive. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and the bottles get larger, of course. Well, can you see? Can you see? Ah. <laughs> okay, another thing, what about the pressure with, compared with the length? And I think the, the easiest way to illustrate it is if you take a column here, and we start with 400 bars here, you know, we end at zero bar in the end of a column. No, there's no pressure there. So if I have 400 bars here, I will have 200 here, and I will have 300 here. So the pressure, because we have the pressure drop is actually what creates our flow. So it also means that if you take and put two columns together, you need double the pressure. So if you have like columns that doesn't take a very high pressure, some of the gel columns that are not of silica, but you have a gel inside, you, there's a maximum length simply because if you go above that, you'll just start to compress the column. So when you're operating very close to the maximum limit of your, what your column can take, you cannot increase the length. So another thing is that peaks always get broader and broader. This is actually why we run. You cannot make peaks, you know, compress them. The always diffusion is something that happens. So whenever you do chromatography and think things time, and it has the cost that you get a broader peak and you get poor sensitivity. And so and, and so more or less also so going up in, let's say you have a difficult separation. You know, like the logos of the one we had an example. Um, you know, just doubling the length of the column doesn't help much. That's, we can calculate a separation factor with these two, and I'm not going into that because that's above the level you need. But it's just that really to get a better separation, it's more or less proportional to the square root of the length. So you, doubling it, you only get like 1.4 times the separation. So usually, if you cannot separate things, play with pH, play with a different phase rather than length.
Okay, so here are some examples, and this is called isocratic. So isocratic means that we have the constant conditions in the HPLC. And the old HPLC days, um, you know, many people ran isocratic separations because it's very more reproducible. Also, if you go to the pharma industry still, they run a lot of, uh, of this to maintain really, really stable retention time. So here's a lot of analytes, eight. If you eject them at 90%, let's say methanol or acetonitrile, you see we only get like three peaks. We can then let go up. Let's program the pump slightly lower organic. See, now you get start to get separation, and now it's actually starting to look a little bit nice. There's still two analytes, so we cannot resolve, but um, life gets easier. Now we have all analytes almost separated. This one not to baseline, but, um, but reasonable. But if you're a biologist, you're probably generating a lot of samples. Especially if you're working with fermentation, they're the worst. They, yeah, they want to follow their time profiles and stuff. So they just generate thousands of samples, and that's nice. We have many systems. So you also see now we are going above one hour. And another thing, when you run in isocratic mode, you will see your peaks get broader and broader. Because they have more time to diffuse. Going further, so now we are down at 30% organic. And now I don't even think we get six, seven, and eight out of the system. They stay there until somebody takes up to high organic, and then they're flushed out. Yeah. Oh, sorry. They come out. But no, that's a 35. We go a little bit up, and now it's two hours, more than two hours to get the last one out. <coughs> so, um, yeah. Then, of course, you can say that why don't we take some steps? 30, 45, and so on, and then we can get them all out. Now we are more happy. But then again, why just? do it all and do it continuously in gradient mode, which is what everybody does today. So you could take 10 to 90 in, here in 40 minutes and we get everything separated. And here we um, get it even faster and now we start to get into trouble. But of course, if we get a more efficient column, so a column with a smaller particle size, we could squeeze the, the peaks together and it could still be, we could separate them nicely. Another thing, working with real samples and not just pure standards in, in solvents, is that um, you know there will be shit in them and they will clog your column. So we have what we call a pre-column. So it's usually the same material as is inside the main column. It's just a very tiny amount, and um, we can put that in front of the column, and we can take this small thing out and, uh, and um, throw it out and put a new one in. And in some labs where they have really lots of dirty samples, they change this part every day. The important thing is that, they, of course, they have to be much cheaper than the analytical columns, because they kind of make your analytical column last longer. But if they are too expensive, then and sometimes they are, then it doesn't give sense. And there's a lot of companies who call their stuff, something like security guard or guard cartridge. These up here, a true, color, a, a true uh, guard column is actually packed exactly as your own column. They're usually too expensive. So if we want a, a cheaper alternative, um, and that's made in these guard columns, and again, dirty samples, we, change, we could change this every day. Important thing is, it's the same phase that is as inside your, your column, so if it go, the idea is if, that if it goes through the guard column, it probably also gets through the analytical column. And if it stopped there, well, it would probably have killed the other one. Um, so another thing. We need to inject our sample in the right solvent. So next time, you will do an extraction of 
some agar plugs. I think no, no, we're good. So you will take some biomass here, and we're gonna add some dichloromethane. Isyl acetate and actually also some methanol, which are not mixable with water. And so we cannot take this directly and filter it and put it into the HPLC, because then we're going to have small droplets coming through the column, and these droplets of isyl acetate dichloromethane, they're going to contain some of your analytes, so they, uh, before they are kind of disappearing, they could go several centimeters into the column. Uh, and or perhaps even go through here. So here's an example, an extreme from the textbook, that if you inject a very high volume of sample, it will kind of take all your analytes through unretained. And that means that all your goodies are coming out in one peak and no retention. That's not interesting. So if you could resolve your sample uh, in more water, if it's in a reverse phase system, then that's, that's helpful. And so the, uh, if you take a standard HPLC book, they will say which gradient will you start at to solve your sample there. That is in many cases not possible. But so we actually we do often dissolve in methanol even though it's got good, but we can only inject then a very low amount. So that could be let's say one to two microliter uh, on a two millimeter ID column. And of course, if you go on diameter, you can scale that to the cross section. Um, so a very big problem, and we see many papers that will come to an example, people inject too much and you get poor chromatography. So this is the worst example I've ever seen. It's actually published. So they worked on some bacterial signaling molecules, and this one is actually also a target for them. And so they eject far too much. So this is probably the true retention time of the column, of the analyte of this one. But because they inject too much, it eludes, some of it eludes after the two minutes and it just comes at one big peak at, at many, many minutes. Simply because this methanol plug that is, slide, that is coming into the column uh, will actually start moving the analytes in the column, even though it should, if you inject it very little, it will like just stay in the start of the column. Also pH. So we recall these are the fumonisins we talked about. So if we have them in ammonium hydroxide, pH 11 or 12, and we inject a lot, then we also have a problem, and this is why these two isomeres, uh, the first isomere is much more broader. So, big, so also if you have a very different pH uh, that will make your analyte more polar, you also you perhaps have to change the pH of the sample. Let me just drop this one. So, here's a little assignment for you, and, and it's actually something slightly different than I talked to, but I hope that you are clever enough to see it. So you see this peak, and it doesn't look nice. And the hint is that in, when you look here, now I take it from 3 to 65, and I get a really nasty, ugly peak. But if I inject it at 20%, then it gets nice and sharp. So what is happening? Maybe we should take a break in connection with that exercise, just five, ten minutes. Yeah, let's take five minutes here. And then we have a few slides after that, so I hope we can finish half. Yeah.